The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and Freedomslips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, Freedomslips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Cosmic Catastrophe on Revolution.Radio. I am your host, Diamond, from the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, and joining us today is my lovely partner and co-host, Leah Shaper. Hello. Welcome to the program. For those of you out there, we are going to have a mind-blowing show as usual. <laughs> what, if I, what if I were to tell you that the two largest supervolcanoes on Earth are unknown to most people. Yeah. That would that does that even make sense? Yeah, that's funny. Now the reason is that both of these supervolcanoes were recently discovered. In fact, the largest caldera ever discovered in the Philippines was only discovered in 2019. And we'll oh, get wow. to we'll get to that after we discuss the second largest caldera, Gackle Ridge Caldera. Now, the Gackle Ridge caldera was first identified through bathymetry because it was in its uh, infancy, um, and they really hadn't mapped much of the seafloor up in the Arctic because, first of all, it's hard to get to, and we didn't have the technology. But in 1991, bathymetry revealed not only did the mid-ocean ridge go all the way up into the Arctic Circle, which is now the part we're talking about is the Gackle Ridge, but at the termination or the end of this mid-ocean ridge was a huge hole. So and repeat this that because you just froze up a, a bit. Okay. Um, at the end of the Gackle Ridge or this portion of the mid-ocean ridge was a gigantic caldera. And it yeah. measured about uh, over 100 kilometers long, about 3,000 feet deep. And it was one of the biggest calderas ever identified on Earth. I think it was uh, 80 kilometers long. Okay. And I, I think this was 1999, not 1991, unless okay. I'm missing something. Maybe I'm missing some of the history. Well, we're, we're going to get, we're going to read it in just a second here. But yeah. Before, before we get into the specifics of Gackle Ridge, um, we're going to share the screen. Can you see this? Yeah. So, as far as super volcanoes are concerned, most people know about 18 of them. But there are, in fact, potentially 20 or more because on this supervolcano map, they're missing the two biggest calderas, the Gackle mm -hmm. supervolcano and Apolaki, which is off the shore of the Philippines, which was the most recently discovered and, in fact, the largest caldera on Earth measuring, I think, 100 miles wide. Oh, wow. So that's going to be a big one. And so... What we're going to glean here by the end of the show, and I'm going to tie it all together with you. You and I have discussed the shift in the ice ages from the 41,000 year to the 100,000 year cycle. Yeah. Amazingly enough, that shift occurred 1.1 million years ago. Yeah, I, I was definitely wanting to look at the most recent Gackle crater eruption which is about 1.1 million years ago and that made me go hmm what changed because and we'll get to this but uh that eruption probably was atmospheric you know yes. explosion you know so that that in and of itself is going to cause some kind of climactic change um but i'm also wondering potentially about earth expansion etc but we'll get there okay so Another thing you should glean from the supervolcano map is most supervolcanoes are on continents. They are yeah. on uh, continental plates. And, and on it, subduction zones. Yeah, the majority of them are within a few hundred miles of a subduction zone. Um, it's hard to tell about the ones here in North America because I think La Garita may be Yellowstone's hotspot, which is now in Yellowstone. Yeah. And so some of these are hot spots. The majority of them are on subduction zones, and almost 90% of them occur on land. 
So there are very few underwater supervolcanoes. Well, and also, I mean, Gackle Ridge, as far as I understand it, is the only supervolcano that we know of that is on a rift as opposed well, to a subduction zone. When we look at the Philippine supervolcano, there yeah. may be a rift there too. Yeah, okay, so that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So all of these clearly need access to the mantle because they have huge amounts of lava. A supervolcano is defined as a volcano that expels so much lava at a certain volume. Um, I don't know what the threshold is. We'll we'll read it right out of the facts. I think it is it's, a it's a I think it's a thousand kilometers cubed is the thousand is the cubic cutoff. kilometers. Where and like uh Geckel is like three thousand kilometers cubed as far as the amount of material ejected. Right. And so the phenomenon of supervolcano, when you get this much magma coming out, like all the way from the mantle, it leaves a huge void underneath the crust. And then subsequently the crust drops down into that hole, mm -hmm. which, which helps scientists determine how big the magma chamber was and potentially how big the volcanic eruption was. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, correct? Yes. Now we're going to read it right off of the uh, the screen here. While the exact number isn't certain, there's thought to be 20 supervolcanoes on Earth. The 18 we showed you and the two others we're going to be discussing now, Gackle Caldera and Apolaki. 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 Um, supervolcano, ironically, isn't even a scientific term. It was first used in the 1940s and since around the 2000s gained popularity and now is widely accepted by the scientific community. And there's even a Wikipedia that defines it. Not that that makes it real or not. Well, I mean, once you define it and you give it a threshold, I think you could argue that now it's a scientific term. <laughs> yeah, so the volcano is categorized as a supervolcano if it can produce a magnitude eight eruption on the VEI index, which is means it's discharging a thousand cubic kilometers of material. And so what that means is that in the past, people have falsely attributed VEI-7s as supervolcanic eruptions. Sure. Yep. I mean, this is a bit arbitrary, right? Like everything's right. on a scale, you know, but I mean, at least it does give us a, a, a general idea of, the, the, of what, what kinds of magnitudes we can look at. Exactly. And, but these are unique in the fact that they form giant calderas as well. Yeah. So before the eruption, magma collects in a chamber below the surface, pressure builds until the magma eventually ruptures the crust. And during an eruption, the chamber empties at least a thousand cubic kilometers of material onto the surface, which causes the crust then in that spot to collapse. I mean, a very small scale version of this is happening in Grindavik in Iceland right now. Yeah. So each time one of those fissure eruptions pumps out, you know, 10 cubic kilometers, there's a void and the town is sinking. Yeah. It's very unstable and very dangerous. Yeah. So, but this is on a massive scale because these super eruptions produce giant calderas that are 50 kilometers wide or bigger. Mm -hmm. And we're looking, unfortunately, you can't see this in the radio, but we're looking at Toba Lake here. It is a massive caldera. They just thought it was a lake until they studied this area. Right. And they're like, oh my God, it was a big <laughs> eruption. <laughs> so the Toba eruption occurred 74,000 years ago and is not the most recent supervolcanic eruption. And, and that title goes to the Topa uh, volcano in New Zealand, which erupted 26,500 years ago. Okay. And probably... A good reason why archaeology shows that humanity moved into that region around 28,000 years ago. <laughs> Interesting. Because most people would have been dead. So if it, And we'll get to that at the end of the podcast here. We, if we have time, we're going to discuss what would occur if a supervolcano erupted in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's the general background on supervolcanoes. And... The good news is most of these are extinct and a lot of them blew off around 20 to 30 million years ago uh, during a time when the Rocky Mountains were formed and it's called the Campanian Ignimbrite period. Remember we talked about that? Mm -hmm. Very difficult words to pronounce. <laughs> but Or remember uh, if you're not a geologist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, 
But let's talk about the two super volcanoes that nobody knows about. We're going to start with Gackle Ridge because there's lots of peer reviewed papers because this one has been known for over two decades now. So, and you are correct. It's 1999. So that's 25 years. Well, and interest, it's interesting too, because I was reading earlier today that uh, the Russians in particular did a lot of research in this area to map the seafloor. And I guess they didn't, find this caldera at that time because this is like up until the 60s basically they were doing this research but we didn't find this of, i hmm? saw some of the 3d imaging from that and yeah they travel up gackle ridge all the way to the end and i was expecting when they get there there'd be a big hole yeah but instead they have it as a ring structure but they don't have it as a hole they have like a volcano in the middle it's kind of weird so 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 what, would the suggestion be that the sediments have moved around in such a way that it kind of obscured the caldera? No, maybe they were using sonar instead of satellites and they got just terrible data. Okay, yeah. That could be it. They just didn't put the ship where it needed to be. Yeah. So this giant caldera was located in the eastern segment of the Gackle Ridge and it could first easily be seen on a bathymetric map of the Arctic Ocean that was published in 99. In 2014, seismic and multi-beam echo sounding data were acquired at the location. Now, this is going to be high resolution 3D imaging, and they're going to get a good look at this caldera. And in fact, that data probably goes into the Google Maps system here. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's give you a quick look at these calderas. The first one we'll go look at is Apalaki, the one that was just discovered. If you come over to the Philippines and you just start to increase the size, right over the northern portion here, you're going to see a large circular depression. And this is the largest caldera on Earth. We'll get to that in a bit. And it was er still erupting after the caldera fell down. You can see here one, two, three, four other volcanic cones here, five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the end of the supervolcanic eruption, which is typical. There's the big explosion, and then it stays active for thousands of years afterwards. Right. So that is the scale of the largest caldera on Earth just recently discovered. <clears throat> now we'll come over to the U.S. here. We'll go to the Atlantic. We'll just come up here into the Arctic. Here's Greenland. The Atlantic Mid-Ocean Ridge comes up here through Iceland, right through the center of Iceland. <laughs> and you could see it here, which is why we have all that volcanic activity. It kind of breaks apart in two arms. And then do you see this weird offset here, this faulting? Yeah. And then it begins again. So the it kind of breaks apart at Iceland. And there's two rifts here I can see, not yeah. a single mid-Atlantic ridge anymore. And in fact, the mid-Atlantic ridge, the active one, curves through Iceland and emerges up here at the Tiernus fracture zone. So this is the current active mid-Atlantic mid Ridge. And then there's an offset to here. So this I, must and have I been, think, go ahead. Am I correct in thinking that this is sort of where we actually call it the Arctic Mid-Ocean Ridge? Like it's still part of the Atlantic Mid-Ocean Ridge, but we're sort of referring to it a bit more specifically here? Yeah, because this displacement of a thousand miles that makes it a whole new active ridge. Do you see how it just yeah. terminates? Yeah. So that's because yeah. it's not continuous. But I think this is just due to transverse faulting. Sure, sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, technically this is what this Arctic mid-ocean ridge here is separating the North Atlantic plate from the Eurasian plate here. Exactly. Now, uh, you see, it has this nice hook here. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that in a bit after we talk about the caldera. This rift is very active and there has been numerous papers on the volcanism that we, we may delve into. Mm -hmm. So you travel up the ridge here between Greenland and Svalbard here, and you can see how deep the rifting gets up here. Mm -hmm. And the, it doesn't allow you to go up into this zero point. Look at that. Yeah. See that? It's yeah. weird. You got to <laughs> rotate it around to Siberia. And so this, this mid-ocean ridge, very active here on the thick section. You can see that, why that would be, because it's actively spreading here. Mm -hmm. And you keep following it up, and it terminates right here in this weird elongated hole and in fact yeah. that is <clears throat> that is the gackle ridge caldera or super volcano and, and from it's... down here from the scale it looks to be about 20 miles wide and maybe 40 miles long it's supposed to be 80 kilometers long and 40 miles wide i'm 40 kilometers wide okay 
So this is a big baby. It's one of the top two largest holes on earth. And it looks like there's not much spreading past this. This is definitely the termination point of something happening in earth. Mm -hmm. Now, a couple unique features about this, the lava here underneath Apolaki, as well as Gackle Ridge, it's basaltic. Because mm-hmm. this is on a mid-ocean ridge, it is not your typical super volcano con- composition. Yeah, super volcanoes typically consist of highly explosive, siliceous, rich magmas, which occur when you mix crustal rocks with these mantle rocks. Mm-hmm. This has no crustal rocks to mix in silica. So the big question is, how did these super volcanic eruptions occur if they weren't consisting of the right viscosity of magma? Well, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, the 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 explanation in one of these papers, right, is that while the magma coming up underneath is basaltic, the temperatures are very low here, right? So this is another problem. You have like a low temperature because of the location on earth it's low temperature which ena- enables this like slow melt which then starts to melt some of the the silicates in the crust right which is then what causes essentially a, a super volcano because now you have something that's trapping volatile gases based on the change of chemistry does this make sense yeah and we'll we'll get to that when we get to apalaki because it's been demonstrated that uh, that occurred there, but additionally, these are on rift zones, right? So yeah. as the magma accumulated, rifts would have opened up and it would be dumping magma out on the surface, not all at once. Mm-hmm. What this does over a period of decades or hundreds of years is creates a giant cap rock on top of right. the magma chamber, which right. adds insult to injury, building those volatiles, and allowing more magma to accumulate than ever before. Right. Resulting right. in a final explosion of the cap rock. Yeah. Now, yeah, both so these bit- are at ridiculous depths. Apalaki is at 12,000 foot deep. Yeah, no, and that's the other thing, right? You're, you're also under tremendous pressures at this depth, too. Yeah. So that's another factor in the equation that, uh, to be honest with you, I don't entirely understand. It would be like it's mimicking a high viscous magma at these depths. If it had a cap rock, it would take extreme amounts of pressure to build to blow out of that because of the downward right. force. So yeah. I think that can easily explain how these super volcanic eruptions are occurring at such depths. Yeah, yeah. Now, the good news is these wouldn't be as destructive as a surface super volcano because the majority of the ejecta and material for both of these it is considered to be captured by the ocean water and doesn't reach the surface. Only Gackle Ridge um, is based on the size and intensity. uh, Only Gackle Ridge is thought to have reached the surface. Mm -hmm. And not- Not not the the Philippine- Not the Philippine one. Okay. What is the name of that again? Apolaki. Apolaki, I remember. Okay, that helps. All right, so the giant caldera that we just looked at located on the eastern segment of the Gackle Ridge was first seen in 99, and then in 2014, there was amazing echo sounding data, which probably gave us that mapping that we just looked at. Mm -hmm. And the caldera is 80 kilometers by 40 kilometers wide and a depth of 1.2 kilometers. The total volume ejected like you said earlier, is estimated at no less than 3,000 cubic kilometers. And this places it in the same category with the largest quaternary calderas, including Yellowstone and Toba. Yeah. And until these were discovered, Toba was considered probably the most voluminous eruptions (laughs) on Earth. Yeah. Uh, And the time of this eruption was 1.1 million years ago. This didn't hit me like what that meant until I was like, let me see, uh, let me go look at the Pleistocene temperature data Mm -hmm. and see if there's a marked drop in temperature. And then that would confirm that this did reach the surface and darken the skies. Yeah. 
And what I found was that's the exact flexure point from the 41,000 year cycle to the 100,000 year cycle. So that's which really also interesting. corresponds to a very significant drop in temperature. So, I mean, obviously the first incident of, you know, major temperature drop off from the eruption is obviously going to occur, but then that it also induces a cycle change that's determining how that happens. That's another question. There's something else going on here. Yeah. And so what happens after 1.1 million years is that the rapid climate change cycle goes from very rapid 41,000 year ice age cycle to a hundred thousand year ice age cycle, 1.1 million years ago. Very interesting. And there's no real significant temperature drop except the one at 1.1 million years ago here. But mm -hmm. I, you would think it would be deeper than a general trend. Do you know what I mean? Well, like, maybe there's a not. general trend here. I thought there might be an outlier that comes down here, but there isn't. And maybe, maybe that is a function of the fact that this is an underwater volcano to start with. So perhaps the ejecta into the atmosphere is, is somewhat limited. Yeah, because... I mean, you were talking two and a half miles of ocean. It has to go through. Most right. of the material is going to stay right on the bottom. And in fact, uh, the sediment cores show that there's material as far as a, th a thousand. How far away was it? I don't remember, but it's very far away. Yeah. Maybe a thousand kilometers away from the caldera itself. Right, right. So, yeah. So I, I think we could probably safely assume that there's limited ejecta into the atmosphere. And so the temperature drop off is going to be somewhat limited. But it's so big that it changes the climate cycle on Earth. It, Perhaps it could just be a, it could just be, you know. I yeah. I mean, I I have another idea about that, but it's not very well fleshed out. So we'll get there. But yeah, here it perhaps. is. Thin thin layers of the volcanic material related to the eruption were identified in cores a thousand kilometers away. Yeah. So I yeah. wonder if those cores are. <laughs> uh, it says sedimentary cores. Now that might usually when you're looking for volcanic eruptions, you go inside lake deposits. So if there is lake deposits, then we know it reached the surface. So we can say some of it reached the surface on this particular super eruption. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, any other comments on that? Not at the moment. Okay, cool. So, and the whole reason this is uh, Gackle Ridge, and they've known about this for a long time, is because of J.J. Gackle, who in who fact was, was probably... Um, the Soviet? Soviet polar explorer measuring the depths. Yep. Mr. Gackle himself. So it wasn't until the second half of the last century that American explorers discovered the Alpha Ridge in the central part of the Arctic Ocean which would be the Arctic Mid-Ocean Ridge. Is that what you refer to it as? Yes, yeah. Oh, so something else I want to throw out there too. I think in the most recent research that's been done in this area, it's kind of interesting to read about what's involved in really surveying this ridge and, and taking samples, right? Because basically what they had to do is take like a nuclear submarine up there, right? And then you have to anticipate all of the ice flows because you need your boat to just... If you're on a boat, let's say you're on, on, on an icebreaker boat doing this, you need to just drift along while you send an ROV down, right? So you have to anticipate all of the ice flows and hope that like you're in the right place for the ROV to come back up. So it's pretty, pretty intensive and complicated to do this. I would agree, but it must be easy now with global warming. Yeah. <laughs> Here are the brass facts. The caldera was identified for the first time on the international bathymic, bathymetric chart of the Arctic Ocean Ibaco version one um, compiled by a group of international explorers back in 1999. So we knew about this a long time ago. It's amazing because it's so difficult to get to. That's why it took 14 year, 15 years for them to uh, release a paper, comprehensive paper on this caldera. Yeah. Crazy. Um, so we're not going to have a commercial. That's good news. If you go over to the Smithsonian Global Volcanism Program, they actually have East Gackle Ridge um, on the list of active volcanoes. Mm -hmm. And I did a podcast on this. Along that section of the Mid-Ocean Ridge, there are subsurface volcanoes. 
that they call Odin, Thor, and Loki. Kind of interesting. They're currently active. Yeah. And did you take a look at those papers? Yes, I did. All right. So this one that came out in 2023, low degree mantle melting controls the deep seismicity and explosive volcanism of Gackle Ridge. Oh, actually it came out in 2022. Uh, and then there's another open access hot vents beneath the icy ocean, the Aurora vent field Gackle Ridge revealed. Um, so the yeah, bad the news is the two paper is the one that sort of explains this proposed mechanism of, you know, because it's low degree melting that it's sort of creating this situation where you've got this, uh, magma building up and changing composition and getting the silicates in there, allowing it to acquire the volatile compounds that ultimately leads to an explosive type volcano. Yeah, and I'm going to agree with that because when I looked into Apolaki, they've got the same geology happening there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's that. Here's a picture of what you were discussing. Yeah, this. the pro yeah. the process. And what's more interesting is they actually show this icebreaker here. Mm -hmm. So the conditions aren't that good. No, no, it's like very tricky to do. I mean, obviously you want to do this in the warmer months. Um, but there's all kinds of, you know, you can only predict these ice flows for about six to 12 hours. So you're relying on satellite data to get a prediction of where the ice flow is going to be and where you need to drift. And you have to work out all of the timing so that the ROV has enough time to gather samples, uh, and come back up and meet you in the right place. Well, it looks like on this, that's tethered. I, it's tethered for mo, mo I think it, I think it gets untethered at the point where it, goes down to actually grab samples. That was the impression I had. Okay. Actually, I don't know. I don't know that this is tethered at all. I think those are just lines to show the direction of travel of the ROV. Well, the good news is that there's no people on there, um, like on the Titanic sub. Right. So all you're going to lose is a very expensive piece of equipment. Right. So <laughs> fi they finally went and did the work. And the bad news is that Gackle Ridge may very well still be active because there's low level volcanism happening there. The, mm -hmm. that, that the volcano, those subsurface volcanoes I showed you, Thor, um, Loki, what's the other name? And Odin, uh, Thor, yeah. Loki, and Odin. These are actively erupting. Yeah. And the, then here comes the bad news and we'll break it to you here at the midpoint. <clears throat> it was once thought that you would have decades, if not centuries of warning before a super volcano erupted. Yeah. But unfortunately, when they studied in high resolution, the next volcano we're gonna get to, Apolaki, what they found is that the, the buildup to the first eruption took 10 million years, and then the buildup to the second similar eruption took 10,000 years, or something completely yes. different. Um, and another paper, which I couldn't find, came out about three years ago, also suggested that without prior knowledge of what the buildup of the last supervolcanic eruption was, there's no way to know what the precursor is to the current supervolcano you're looking at. Yeah. Well, but also you're talking about periods of time for building up the pressure that are so long that it's almost meaningless for us, right? So... You're not like going to get a warning. We know when it started, that. right? Right, right. We don't have those types of time frames. Yeah. <clears throat> so they did an amazing job here, uh, imaging these volcanic vents here on the bottom. Yeah. I find that fascinating how how high resolution it is. Yeah. But is By there the any? Way, I, I wonder if we should uh, not not in this show, but also spend some time looking at the East Africa Ridge. That's expanding because that looks like it might become uh, very explosive in the future, and I I wonder if there's sort of a similar phenomena going on there. Yeah, well, where that active volcanism is, uh, I think it's north of Zambia. There's a couple I forget the name of the their basaltic flows. They are constantly erupting with new cones, and what they've laid down is hundreds, if not thousands, of feet of basalt capping. Yeah capping that rift zone. Yeah, and it's a huge area. The rift zone itself is enormous. Okay, so we're coming back over here. 
to the U.S., go across the Pacific. The Pacific that keeps expanding. And make our way over to the Philippines and this giant depression here. Mm -hmm. So this is Apolaki. And let me clear my throat. Why is this playing here? The world's <laughs> largest caldera discovered in the Philippines back in 2019. It's amazing that, that the bathymetry was probably around. Nobody's looking at it. I mean, you could have probably seen it on Google Earth. Yeah, I think it's just a function of like who's actually working on this stuff and who's actually looking. And maybe they're just there's just not that many people doing that. Well, a team of marine geophysicists recently published a paper describing a large igneous massif east of the island of Luzon. It's located on the bottom of the Philippine Sea. And so this massif, you really can't see it here, but I'm going to outline it. See how it's kind of smoother here? Yeah. And so before this caldera dropped down, right in this area, there was a very long period of time where basalt was being slowly ejected and flowing out on the surface, creating a huge rise on the bottom of the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And it was this rise that created that cap. Um, and then this baby blew. What's interesting here is they suggest the drop down isn't that severe here as in Gackle Ridge, mm -hmm. which is literally 3,000, a mile drop down. It's a little mm -hmm. less severe here. Um, and they suggest that it wouldn't have resulted in severe tsunamis at the surface because of the amount of distance from the surface. Mm -hmm. It would have, it, the displacement down at 12,000 feet would attenuate before it got to the surface. Does that make sure. sense? Yeah. 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 Because it's so far down. And this volcano may not have ever reached the surface. Mm. What's what's the last uh, suspected eruption? This is a super old one, 24 million years ago. Okay. And it's not active. No. And th these would have been within the million years after the big caldera collapse because mm -hmm. it's going to put pressure on the remaining magma and there's going to be a couple of cones that come up here. Uh, in the form of small volcanoes mm -hmm. to squish out the rest. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it was just recently discovered. The research suggests the submarine mountain Massif represents the remnants of a volcanic caldera with a diameter of 150 kilometers, which is almost double Gackle Ridge. That's crazy. <laughs> And it's also twice the size of the famous Yellowstone caldera. Didn't Pierce Morgan recently walk off trail and get arrested or someone? I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> so gravimetric analysis shows the Benham Rise, as the submarine mountain massif is named, consists of, look at this, a nine-mile thick layer of magmatic and volcanic rocks. So that's wow. how thick the cap was. Wow. Wow. And, well, it started effusing to create that massive 47.9 million years ago. Mm -hmm. And then the final boom is assumed to be the end event 26 million years ago. Did I say 24? Uh, something like that. Yeah. So I guess 26 is the end game there. Okay. Um. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> so uh, you said that this illustrates that same phenomena of a low temperature melt creating this situation. Yes, exactly. And and that's because of the depth of where this is, the, the low temperature? Oh, it's just, not... just as deep as Gackle. But okay. we just revealed that there's nine miles. How much was there? Nine miles of basalt. So there's a nine mile cap over top of this source, which makes it ever more difficult for the magma to get to the surface and allows more to build and less to come out. Right. Right. And then and then as it's building up, that magma is melting the crust, which has silicates in it. Right. Which then allows 
that and now the magma, the composition of the magma has changed and allows it to take on volatile compounds, making it explosive. Yeah, so if you think about it this way, typically the magmas that come out of the mid-ocean ridge are highly basaltic, no silica. Right. But if you squirt out, let's say, you know, a 10 meter thick layer over a hundred square miles, and then it the eruption stops for decades, what's gonna be deposited on top of that? Sand from the ocean right. and then there'll be another eruption so it's making an alternating layer cake of basalt and sand basalt and sand and then if you melt it as the magma is coming up this nine mile thick layer cake of basalt and sand the subsequent ma magma is not going to be basalt because it now has silica in it and yeah. so it will shift towards andesite and from the geologic studies of gackle ridge the super volcanic eruption that occurred, which was the drop down of that caldera, was not basaltic. It was andesitic. So right. they kind of have the geochemistry to prove that there is being silicates being reincorporated into it. And from the data from this volcano, take a look. It took from 47 to 26, it took 20 million years of layer caking to get enough silica in this for it to go boom. So it's a long process. Well, right. Okay. So here's here's the thing. There, there's still a distinction I think we need to make, right? Because what the process that you just described is essentially what would be happening at any ocean ridge, correct? No, because the the no, because the ocean no. ridges are divergent, so they spread away as yeah. the new basalt comes into the middle. Okay. So, so we're not never, getting the, the crustal it, melting, basically. The the melting. Right, you would so need to have massive effusive basalt flows which is not typical the mid-ocean ridge is slowly like rolling out yeah in this case at the termination point there were these massive effusive lavas that kept cooling on top of itself so there was no rifting at at the end of where the gackle caldera is okay was because, because part of the explanation for gackle ridge literally has to do with the fact that this is very low temperature because of the the, the position on earth I, the depth is more important than the position. Right. Anywhere right. you're 12,000 feet deep, it's going to be epically cold and high pressure. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Yep. Okay. It's not like you got, if you go up the Arctic, it's any colder at 12,000 feet. It's probably the same freezing cold. Right. Right. It's below the point of freezing, but it's salt water. Yeah. I mean, it's insane what's Plus going on. Plus high pressure. Plus high pressure. Yeah, That's going to exactly. make exactly. But this interesting, is interesting too because the position of this caldera is, I mean, it's pretty close to a continental shelf, and yet it's really deep. Right, and what I saw is this crack right through the middle here. Mm. There's the caldera. I mean, that looks like it rift, a rift, a rift right there. Yeah. But we are on the subduction zone here. And so there is subduction happening here, which is why these islands exist. They're volcanic right. in nature. They wouldn't be above the sea level. They're formed from magma. So yeah. this could be some kind of a remnant hotspot that's right further away from the subduction zone than the actual. So this would be like looking at, if we're looking at the Western US, um, you would have a subduction zone off the coast where the Cascadia is, right? Then mm -hmm. these islands would represent the Cascades. Yes. So this, and then inland, this would represent Yellowstone or La Garita. Right, right. It's so this is more setup. typical. This is you, more typical for a super volcano as opposed to Gackle Ridge, which is not right. anywhere near a subduction zone. <laughs> no, that is the only super volcano associated with a rift, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. A mid ocean ridge, not a rift, a mid ocean ridge. My bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah, and it is the large world's largest caldera, Apolaki Caldera, 150 kilometers or 93 miles wide. That's amazing. And from what we know about the Toba eruption, which is half the size, the volume of this eruption would be crazy. Mm -hmm. And so I have a paper here, the morphology and structure of... They were questioning it in 2022, but it's been confirmed. What may be Earth's largest caldera? And if you're listening out there, um, all of these links to all the papers will be below the video tonight on Magnetic Reversal News.
So one other thing that I thought was really interesting uh, to think about, and um, this might require some of our listeners to go back and listen to a few shows where we talked about the Earth expansion hypothesis, um, which is a bit out there, but um, the more we've discussed it and looked at the evidence, the more interesting it becomes. Um, but one of the, you know, the, the model sort of for expansion is as if Earth is like a like an orange and you've cut the peel um, and it, and it, and the peel is separating from the bottom. So you get these sections that are kind of lifting away. And so what's sort of interesting to me about this is if, if that were the case, then we have this Arctic mid ocean Ridge where we have expansion happening, albeit at an extremely low rate, right? Like this is the slowest expanding uh, Ridge that we know of. Um, but it kind of made me wonder if perhaps part of the mechanism here is that as this orange peel is kind of lifting up while it's expanding, it's also causing some kind of pressure up here. What do you think of that idea? Well, I like it. Um, and so I want to just take a look at this extent of this Arctic mid-ocean ridge, the Arctic mid-ocean ridge here. It begins at this transform fault here, which splits the end of the mid-Atlantic ridge, ends here, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this would have been connected at some time. Right. But this right. is cracking as part of that orange peel effect. Yeah. But you can determine the rate of spreading on a rift based on the elevation on either side and the chasm in the middle. So you can clearly see from here to here, this is the most active spreading. Yeah. And there's very little rifting here, and it almost peters off here. Yeah. Same thing up here. It peters off. So there, if the same amount of magma upwelling is happening underneath of all of this mid-ocean ridge, this is not spreading and allowing you know, the, the magma to move away from where it's coming up. So yeah. it will build up here in a similar right. fashion to Apolaki. Yeah. Well, cause the other thing that it made me think of was, um, I put out this idea to you a while ago when we were talking about earth expansion and, um, you know, cause there, there's sort of a question about why did the Rockies form, right? Because there's no, there's, you don't have two continental plates butting up against each other there. And what I su suggested was that, so if, if the earth really is expanding, you have to consider that as the crust expands like, like this, it's going to have to push some material up here, right? Because there's not going to be enough room for it. Um, and this kind of made me think that perhaps this was something of a similar phenomena here, right? Because this is where you would be getting material almost like pushed in. I mean, yes, there's expansion, but if if you've got that orange peel, oh, if it's going the on, right, if it is the flexure point of the opening, you know, it's expanding right. to the left here, but it's not here. This is where there's a compression point. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, it's a compression point. It's yeah. also falling right in the area of the auroral belt. So if this is a high cosmic ray period, this is where the energy is going to be dumping in too. Yeah, that too. That too. Um, so and, and just. Just for our listeners, just for some background information, the reason that the orange peel phenomena makes sense is because if you look at the rate of expansion at various places on Earth, there's there's more expansion going on in the southern hemisphere, basically, and the Pacific continues to expand, and yet we can't find enough subduction to account for all of that that expansion, right? You know, if, if you've got if you've got ridges pulling away from each other and the earth is the same size, then you have to have other areas where you have subduction of one plate going under and under another, but there's not enough subduction to account for that. And you see even more of the expansion in the southern hemisphere, which is why we say it's like this orange peel effect, because you you get that flexure point in the northern hemisphere somewhere. Right. And we can kind of prove that the most expansion is happening in the southern hemisphere because it's all ocean. Yeah. Yeah. It's where most of the Southern hemisphere is water. Yeah. And it's similar with the Pacific, right? There's, there's very large rates of expansion for the Pacific ocean. I mean, look is, at how wide it is. It's just huge. Look at this. Right. And not nearly enough subduction to keep the earth the same size. So. So it will only be a matter of time before earth expansion theory is accepted more than straight plate tectonics. Yeah. 
because the the whole idea that everything is the same is a relic of the law of uniformitarianism, mm -hmm. which we don't follow because yeah. the earth hasn't been the same for the last five billion years. That's such a simple concept to believe. Yeah. And yet the law of uniformitarianism and geology claims that what's happening now happened in the past and there was nothing ever different. Well, that's I mean, just 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 from the geological data that we have of temperature changes, those cycles and uh, me uh, magnetic changes under all of the, the, the data on all of the proxy data that we have clearly suggest that. The Earth has not always been the same, so it's just it's just silly and ridiculous. I mean, even the the official narrative of the history of the Earth does not say that the Earth has always been the same. So it's just silly. Um, by the way, the more I think about it, um, for Gackle Ridge, this mechanism that we discussed about the e explosivity essentially building up over time. Um, and the and and this magma building up and slowly melting the crust, that actually helps me make a lot more sense of this very slowly expanding ridge, and that it may be a, a flexure point, right? Because you almost don't need compression to happen because you have crust that's melting and then being exploded probably periodically, right? Yeah. Now, didn't the paper, one of the papers that I remember reading last night suggested that there was also a 250,000 year eruption from Gackel. Oh, which I didn't see that. Which coincides with the Brun, Brunus Matayama magnetic reversal. Interesting. Yeah. Which actually is dated to 780 now, but in this paper, they had it at 750 um, and they had... This is from the sediment core data because they were using uh, magnetic minerals to determine dor the oh. eruption. Yeah, no, I think maybe I missed that because I remember sort of reading that section and it was a little bit over my head and I got what a little bit paper? lost in it. Which one was it? Uh, I think it is the 2022 paper. The low degree mantle melting controls the deep seismicity and explosive volcanism of Gackle Ridge. Because I think this is where they're taking a lot of uh, magnetic measurements here. It had really good graphs, but and I can't find them. You, so graphs of the dates. Um, yeah, this is not what I was looking at. All right. Uh, where, maybe it's a different paper that I haven't seen. Yeah, I probably found it last night and didn't save it. I, my apologies, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Well, maybe we'll find it again, and if we find it again, we'll put it in the description box. <laughs> All right, we got a couple minutes here. Can we predict the next supervolcanic eruption? Uh, most likely, no. Yeah. So the low-level activity that's now occurring underneath Campi Flegri, mm -hmm. um, some volcanologists have gone there, and they're making mathematical assumptions on the amount of magma that has built up underneath of it, and based on their calculations, they say, well, there's not a lot to worry about here because based on our calculations, the amount of magma would could only result in a VEI-4 eruption if it went off now. Mm -hmm. The only problem with that is there's conflicting information on that. Sure. Because we really don't know if a supervolcano is simply magma building under underneath the shallow crust over a period of time. It literally could be, because you know what a kimberlite is, correct? Uh, I don't remember the exact definition, and perhaps you should just give the definition for our viewers anyway. <laughs> a kimberlite eruption is, we've never witnessed one, but the kimberlite eruptions is where all the diamonds on Earth come from. Mm -hmm. These are eruptions that are assumed to begin in the mantle and shoot up through the crust without ever building any magma anywhere. And sometimes the pipes can be as small as five feet in diameter. They wow. go all the way to the mantle. And because of the extreme pressure and temperature, and we're coming from the mantle, we're getting these super mafic rocks with large amounts of carbon. And when they instantly depressurize and harden, they form diamonds instantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these kimberlites can, can erupt all the way into space. Jeez. So it's a very strange 
eruption that's very violent, like Hunga Tonga shrunk down to a five foot vent. Wow. And so something similar with super volcanoes on a wider scale is probably happening. And I think that these volcanoes, albeit they do form magma chambers, shallow ones, like the one building under Campi Fulegri, mm -hmm. I think that they're directly connected to the mantle. And right. when you were to say, get that VEI-4 from the magma chamber under Campi Fulegri, it may tap all the way to the mantle and have a direct conduit for massive amounts of lava to come up. Yeah. Making it VEI-8. That's interesting, too, because um, Geckel Ridge notes something similar that 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 there's a there's a, a cut all the way through the lithosphere to the mantle. Oh, so there's proof that th this does have a mantle source then. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that Kimberlites and supervolcanoes, very similar phenomenon on very extreme, two different extreme scales. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Well, so obviously kimberlite would be very unpredictable. Yeah, and in fact, there haven't been any kimberlite eruptions for tens of millions of years. Interesting. And, and so the question, can, can we predict the next super volcano? A paper came out in 2021, Growth and Thermal Maturation of the Toba Magma Reservoir. Um, and let's read the significance here. Understanding the thermal state of magma reservoirs before super eruptions is crucial for interpreting the process leading to such a catastrophic event. Here, we show that the two super eruptions of Toba were preceded and followed by protracted magma influx at relatively constant average volumetric rates over the last 2.2 million years. This suggests that increased magma flux is not essential before a super eruption. Mm -hmm. Instead, long-term thermal maturation of the magma reservoir related to significant magma pulses primes the system for an eruption. So what do you get out of that? That you can't, they don't really have a way to, the amount of magma coming in does not pre preclude a super volcanic eruption. Yeah, right. So the results here indicate significant variations of monitoring parameters such as increased surface deformation, degassing, may not occur before these supervolcanic eruptions. Yeah. And that is some bad news. So we won't know when it happens. Right, in all likelihood. So what would it be like? <clears throat> well, a magnitude 8 eruption is almost unimaginable, especially if it was on the surface. Yeah. Uh, no one alive today has ever seen a supervolcano. The most recent supervolcanic eruption was witnessed by our ancestors. That was New Zealand's Topal volcano, which occurred 26,500 years ago. But I don't even think that pales in comparison to the two eruptions we're talking about. Yeah. And the Pinatubo eruption in 1991 you know, was one of the largest eruptions of the 20th century, but it's uh, VEI-6. So we're talking about, take a look at this explosion and multiply that by a thousand. Yeah. <laughs> that would be unimaginable. Well, wouldn't it be more like multiplying it by 10,000? I mean, we're talking about two ticks up on the VEI scale. Right, it's and each is, linear, time, it's... each is 100 times greater. Oh, 100 times, okay. I'm, I'm, getting, yeah. I'm getting it wrong. But still... If the Honga Tonga eruption, that was that explosion was heard hundreds of miles away. This explosion would rupture most people's eardrums on half of the planet. Yeah. Yeah. And the shock wave. Honga Tonga shock wave went around the world three or four times. Yeah. What what would this this would ring the earth for days? Yeah. And amazingly, we're still here. <laughs> yeah. You know. I mean, obviously, anybody in that vicinity is not going to be there anymore. I don't think you can survive something like that. Well, I'm going to get to some numbers, and it's ridiculous. Yeah. Most people within a thousand mile radius would instantly be vaporized mm -hmm. or buried. Let's talk about uh, Yellowstone, one of the world's most famous supervolcanoes. 
It has super erupted three times in the last few million years. Uh, the eruptions form the Yellowstone Caldera, which is 75 by 55 kilometers, uh, about the size of Gackle Ridge. And it's now the site of Yellowstone National Park. The largest of the eruptions was 2.1 million years ago when it released 2,450 cubic kilometers of material. This is on the surface. Mm -hmm. It wasn't under the ocean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if Yellowstone were to produce another super eruption in our lifetime, the surrounding states of Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana would be directly impacted by pyroclastic flows. That means everyone would burn up. Mm -hmm. Oh, and it's over. <laughs> Brush your fingers, folks, and watch us later tonight on Magnetic Reversal News. Yeah, mountain time. That's a boom. Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message.